The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins from the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Fine, Tom. Thank you. How are you doing? Pretty good, Father. Good, good to be here. Good to see you again. Yep. Father, on a recent program, we talked about this Alfie Evans case that has been unfolding in, in Liverpool, England, and uh, there's been some <clears throat> recent developments where he actually passed away a few days ago. And there's, there's been some, some talk, Father, there's been some speculation that his medical problems were caused by uh, some, some slew of vaccines that he received in England there. And it's, um, there's, there's been some speculation that the government and the, the doctors there at the hospital were, were attempting to actively prevent him from reaching his two-year mark because of these problems that he received, that he uh, incurred from these vaccines, that his family would have been entitled to some sort of monetary compensation uh, for all the, the pain and suffering that he had to go through as a result of, of these vaccines. And so... There's been some uh, some controversy and some speculation uh, saying that uh, that essentially the, they were actively working to prevent him from reaching this two-year mark in order to prevent mm -hmm. uh, that that uh, paying him that that, that mm -hmm. reimbursement for that. So, do you have any comments on well, that? Well, I've seen that story circulating, and uh, I don't know. I haven't verified that if Alfie had lived to um, celebrate his second birthday, mm -hmm. that. Um, the parents could have sued for compensation for the damage done by it. I, I suppose that would have been a, a very, very controversial landmark case because not only might it have involved millions of dollars of compensation that would have had to have been paid, mm -hmm. but that would be just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, if these vaccines um, were brought before the court for uh, serious medical scrutiny, uh, there would have been uh, pharmaceutical companies involved, there would have been insurance companies involved, uh, there might have been not only billions but hundreds of billions or dollars or more uh, regarding many children who were injured by such vaccines. So, I mean, I don't know what the law is. All I can say is that, uh, that there certainly could have been motivation. There was plenty of motivation to make sure that uh, if that were the case, that a parent whose child survived to uh, mark his second birthday um, had been severely injured and it could be proven by vaccines, <clears throat> that, that would have been a, a landmark case and uh, would have been certainly motivation for someone wanting Alfie not to live two years. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to verify what the law is on that. Um, I was actually speaking with a, a gentleman uh, a born and, and bred uh, Britisher, a very fine man, um, just this past Sunday, actually, uh, who had heard my sermon on Sunday mentioning uh, the Alfie Evans case. And he told me that uh, some years ago, his little child took ill in England, came down with a fever, and he did take her into hospital. And uh, basically, they were just giving her the, you know, the ibuprofen and things like that. Uh, you know, I don't want to mention the, tr the names of the, but the, the, giving her things that could be bought very easily to deal with a child fever. If he'd known, he said that if that's what all they were going to do for that child, he certainly would have taken care of the problem at home. Um, but the problem was that they insisted on keeping the child for a total of four days, which is not what uh, he intended or and his wife intended in taking the child into the hospital. Uh, but he, he felt that already some years ago, uh, that the hospital was preempting the tr rights of the parent to decide what is best for the child, and we're not going to allow the child to leave the hospital until they were satisfied. So um, it was a little bit of... Uh, 
Well, it was interesting hearing that straight from the, the mouth of someone who had had a child in the hospital. And it makes one wonder that if, uh, if, a, if a parent of a, of a young child in England now has a child fall ill, will that parent think that he's putting the child at greater risk by taking the child in for medical care in a hospital? such as Alder Hay or one of the other children's hospitals in England, because you're dealing with socialist medicine in which the, the state can actually play the role of God or insist on t assuming the role of God and uh, usurping the rights of parents legally by the courts and basically uh, ultimately determining what, if any, medical care the child is entitled to um, in spite of the parents. And so this is a very serious problem. I would think any, any thinking parent in England will have now is my child in, at greater risk uh, in the hospital or with this medical problem um, out of the hospital. You know? um, but this is what socialized medicine does to people. You, know? you see, you serve parental rights. Now, I mean, it could very well be that Alfie Evans would have died a natural death in any case, by this time, as it turns out, he died at 2.30 a.m. Liverpool time on Saturday, right? I guess it was April 28th, just uh, a little more than 10 days short of his second birthday. Um, the other developments in this case involve claims that seem credible. Actually, they are reported by an Italian... <clears throat> an Italian newspaper, and also LifeSite News has claimed they have verified this, also with two other sources, uh, that on, uh, at about midnight or so on Friday, um, Alfie Evans' father, Tom, was actually called away from the room, uh, leaving his sleeping mother uh, behind, and while Tom would, was called away, which is very unusual, he called away for a consultation in the middle of the night, a nurse entered the room and uh, gave Alfie four injections, injected him with four different drugs. Now, the story is <clears throat> that Alfie's vital signs were actually quite good at that time. He had a blood oxygen level of, of at least 90, I think they said 98%, which was quite good. And um, his heart rate was fairly good, especially for a young child like that. Uh, he didn't look like he was in any danger of dying. But no sooner had uh, Tom returned to the room, his father, than, and the, after the injections were given, but that his uh, blood oxygen level went down, his heart rate went down, and within two hours, he was dead. <clears throat> now, this is more than suspicious. Mm -hmm. And it says something, I think, to what you brought up, the fact that uh, there was a reason for wanting him, this child, to be, die to be dead. Right. And he wasn't dying. That was a problem for them. So now this has not yet been uh, verified, uh, depending on what you mean by verified, I suppose. But uh, these allegations are being made, and those who are making them uh, no doubt are aware of the fact that they are making themselves subject to some very serious penalties if they're wrong. <laughs> so the story is getting out that this child was injected with four different drugs. Now, we know that, that part of Alfie's treatment plan after they pulled the ventilator was to put him on fentanyl, which would have depressed his uh, respiration and would have certainly... Uh, complicated matters for him breathing because they wanted him to stop breathing and that would is, is something that would have helped him to stop breathing so to speak but uh, his father intervened and uh, I guess the hospital was so convinced he was going to die anyway they were just going to let it go but whether one of those four drugs was fentanyl we don't know we know how powerful that is it's, I mean it's used to put down elephants right to sedate elephants <clears throat> and there are many deaths due to it um, so, again, this is all very, very, very suspicious, and very peculiar. But, again, we're talking about socialized medicine here, okay? And not only that, but now reports are coming out that this uh, <clears throat> Mr. Justice Anthony Hayden, 
who had determined that Alfie would not be allowed to go to uh, seek treatment anywhere else. Uh, he would not be allowed to leave that hospital, that now he is calling into question the legal team that tried to um, allow Alfie to leave the hospital or at least to go home. That now the, the lawyers and the individual who was uh, advising the parents, who was actually, I understand, a Russian, but he was not yet a lawyer, but he was part of the legal team, it might have been a paralegal, I don't know. But that now uh, this Mr. Justice Hayden is going after them and is uh, having courts of uh, uh, inquiry looking into them to see if they did something uh, nefarious in trying to, to stand up for the life of this child, or at least for the rights of the parents. So that would be also a, an interesting thing if they decided that they were going to attack the lawyers who were trying to uphold the rights of the parents. Mm -hmm. That would be cranking everything up another notch um, to basically um, threaten the lawyers with some kind of censure or worse just for trying to defend the parental rights. Yeah. You see how the state does not, uh, in a socialist government, the state does not brook any any opposition or any restraint. Mm -hmm. um, scary? It should be to anyone who uh, does not want to live in, in, in tyranny and um, does not want to put his child at risk by seeking medical assistance from the established medical bureaucracy. Right? Father, if, if these reports are true, you know, if, if the, the, these, the, the medical team there actually did deceive the parents and go in and kind of covertly uh, administer these, these drugs to essentially end his life. I mean, how demonic mm -hmm. is that? I mean, it is, it is, certainly. No other word to describe it. I used the word fiendish before, and I think it does apply. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, even, even the statement that uh, Tom Evans, the father, was meant, was, was meant to read, telling the supporters to go home and... Um, the, the, the story now is that that was a, a way that was basically forced upon him uh, uh, that as a result, if he would read that statement, they would give more medical care to his child, that otherwise they were going to withhold. So he had to buy what, what medical, uh, what little help they would give his child, nutrition and so on, he had to buy that by making that statement. I mean, um, talk about having something worse than a gun to your back as a parent. You know? mm -hmm. It is it is truly fiendish. And, and Father, you, you mentioned how uh, parents in, in England, they might be hesitant to even bring their children to the hospital at, at all. And, you know, I recently heard a, uh, a wise man remark that, that with this kind of worldwide trend towards socialized medicine, you know, we see that here in the United mm -hmm. States with, with the Affordable Care Act and, and kind of all over the place that... Uh, this individual said that it seems that where we have the responsibility now to almost kind of learn how to become our own doctors mm -hmm. so that we can kind of prevent this, you know, kind of ha have, have, have a way out of this. A way well, we were warned this. that uh, so-called Obamacare would bring about death panels to decide mm -hmm. whose life was worth saving and who's not. Mm -hmm. When you have single-payer um, medical care, um, there's only so much medical care available and you have to start uh, rationing it. Mm -hmm. It was inevitable, you, you can't get around that. Um, and inevitably, therefore, there are those who have to decide. Uh, and they're usually not so much even in, in the medical, among the medical personnel, more in the business and the political personnel are going to have to be deciding, the courts, whose life is worth saving and who's not. And of course, this creates a very uh, serious seedbed for tyranny where your, your political enemies yeah. They don't deserve to live, yeah. right? And, you know, Tom, our lady talked about a dis dis uh, diabolical disorientation, and this is part of it. And it is so bad that this diabolical disorientation even extends to traditional Catholic, or those who style themselves traditional Catholic clergy. I mean, there were a number of, uh, at least two um, of those who present themselves as traditional Catholic bishops, they're of the took line, but they present themselves this way. 
And at least one, <clears throat> again, who styles himself a traditional Catholic priest, again, a follower now of the Tukline bishops, who actually came out in favor of the death of Terry Schiavo here in this country. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so the thinking of this, I mean, they might be looking at the death of Alfie Evans and saying there's nothing wrong with this. Right. And uh, I mean, the Novus Ordo bishops in England have come out in favor of what the hospital did to Alfie Evans and even praising the hospital for what they did to Alfie Evans. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, here you have these Tukhlai and bishops and the clergy basically supporting the line of argumentation here. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just horrible that they could support this way of thinking. But again, I mean, if they would indulge in the line of thinking necessary to justify the took line, there's really no limitation as to how far they can take that in many different directions, including the death of a Terry Scheibel, who was dehydrated to, to death. I mean, she was put to death by the legal system. And virtually everything that was in play with the Alfie Evans case was in play with the, with the Terry Scheibel case. The parents wanted to take her home to care for her. They said she's not in a chronic, uh, persistent vegetative state. She responds to them. Uh, she's not dying. That's the problem. Uh, they have armed guards on the rooftop to try to kill anyone who would try to rescue her. They have the means to uh, hydrate her and, and give her nutrition right there. I mean, even, even the, the uh, who was it, uh, a priest who was allowed to be there was not allowed to take a sip of water or a, or a cup of, even, even a flower vase with a single rose had water, but he wasn't allowed to give her any of that water to relieve her thirst. He was sitting right by her bedside, but he wasn't allowed to give that water and put it in her mouth because there was an armed guard there to prevent him from doing so. I mean, it is, it is really fiendish what is going on. The fact that you can have took lying clergy who would justify that is just astounding to me. Mm -hmm. And Father, I know you wanted to get into the Tooks tonight because I heard that you oh. recently received a, a brand new challenge to the Tooks. Well, perhaps so. that's why it came to mind. <laughs> yeah. It's true, Tom. I mean, the controversy goes on because there are still people who adhere to the Took line, despite all of the all of the issues and problems uh, and their origins and ongoing problems. Mm -hmm. But you're right, I, I just hit, did hear in the last couple of months from somebody who, who um, sent me some photocopy pages. Um, uh, I don't know if, if the person who sent them to me was actually uh, trying to use them as an argument in favor of the Took line, or just to tell me this is what is being said now in answer to your um, programs. But... Um, there, there were probably 10 photocopy pages. And I'd say prominent among the arguments there was that the Catholic Church traditionally accepts the validity of the Orthodox. The Orthodox, uh, that is non-Catholic, schismatic ordinations. Uh, deacon, priest, Episcopal, bishop, ord ordinations, consecrations. And since the Catholic Church accepts the validity of these ordinations and consecrations. That just shows the traditional mind of the church with regard to them, but also that should apply to the Turk ordinations too. That this is traditional, the traditional way of the church is thinking, so the church traditionally would accept the, the, the Turk consecrations. <clears throat> you follow the logic, right? <clears throat> no, because there is no logic. It is simply, again, um, the, the, the least you can say is it is a total lapse of logic. The worst you can say it is a deliberate smokescreen. Okay? Mm -hmm. But this is what we're getting over and over again. The, the level of thought, the level of response in this is very, very poor. And um, it is troubling that there are Catholic clergy who actually can be taken in and follow that line of thinking because they should know better. But actually, Tom, you know, what they're implying there is kind of a, like a minor premise here. They're implying that the church doesn't scrutinize any of these ordinations or consecration. The church just accepts them all uh, carte blanche, a priori, meaning uh, just in advance, without any question. As long as you're ordained or consecrated, a priest or a bishop, 
by the Orthodox <clears throat> within the Orthodox Church that the Catholic Church automatically accepts each and every one of those ordinations and consecrations. <clears throat> All that the Church is saying is <clears throat> that when the Orthodox Church uses the traditional Orthodox rites, these rites have the matter in form, and they do convey the idea of the true priesthood, and that the ceremonies or the rites involved have not been adulterated and, and corrupted to the point where they're invalid. So going back a thousand years or, and more, okay, when we had the, before the Orthodox schism, they broke away, <clears throat> yes, the church did have this common common ceremonies that they used, Eastern Rite uh, and, and uh, Roman Rite and so on, that were valid. And where the Orthodox continue to use those, those <coughs> traditional rites, yes, the Church says that they, the rites are valid. But if an Orthodox priest wants to sign on, uh, let, let's say, come to the traditional Latin Rite, or join the church or come back to Rome, let's put it that way, okay? When, when the, uh, if an Orthodox priest or bishop wanted to convert and uh, again be accepted and recognized in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, it's absurd to say that the church wouldn't verify the fact that the ordination not only took place, but that it took place properly and that it was valid. So um, if that's the argument they're making, they're making a false argument. The church would very carefully make sure that what was done was, according to uh, you know, Catholic tradition, valid, um, uh, beyond question, because she would never bring a priest or a bishop um, into the church. And furthermore, I mean, the uh, canon law even requires that a priest or a bishop is ordained or consecrated outside the church, they cannot come back as a bishop, cannot come back as a priest, a functioning priest, <clears throat> and simply would not be accepted wholesale. So even, even the, argu the argument even fails there, Tom. When this person, and I believe it was a, 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 a took priest who was arguing this, which is very sad, <laughs> because if his point is to say that the took consecrations and ordination should be simply accepted <clears throat> because the church traditionally it recognizes the validity of the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox consecrations <clears throat> and ordinations. The fact is that according to her own law, the Church says if you're ordained or consecrated outside the Catholic Church, you cannot return to the Church as a priest or a bishop and just automatically, you know, be, be put to functioning as a priest or a bishop. You have to be accepted as a layman. And the, the church will judge from, from that point. So if we're going to apply that principle that he's using, the, 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 the Tuks would have to come back as laymen. They couldn't come back as functioning priests and bishops if you're going to follow that line of logic. Mm -hmm. But as I say, uh, you know, the, the problem here is that the, 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 the level of thought that is presented to convince people that the Tuks must be accepted as perfectly valid and legitimate is wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I think that argument too, it, it shows how uh, they're just grasping for straws at this point mm -hmm. too, to, uh, so, too. to compare themselves to a, to a schismatic sect that, that that's going to prove how they're so traditional and how we should... To use that as an argument, yeah, yeah, I that's, guess effectively that's what's implied there, right? That's, that's pretty sad. But Father, you mentioned the, uh, the Orthodox uh, sects and whatnot, and we have actually several uh, several questions, several different emails concerning that topic that I'd like to discuss briefly here if we could. This first one is, what is the status of the Ukrainian and the Eastern rites? They uh, kind of mentioned here how some of the current uh, hierarchy, they do promote the false ecclesi ecclesiology of the conciliar church, and they've kind of, they, they've signed on with a lot of Vatican II, uh, post-Vatican II teachings and, and all that. So at what point should we attend or not attend a Ukrainian <coughs> parish? And he says that the bishop is actively promoting all of the post-Vatican II conciliar teachings, and the pastor gives Holy Communion to known Orthodox schismatics. So at what point should uh, one stop attending these? Well, it is true. I mean, the Eastern Rites have undergone their own modernization. There are still traditional Eastern Rite priests and bishops uh, that follow the true, you know, the old 
Eastern Rite. But there are many who have been uh, Novus Ordoized. They've got their own Novus Ordo Eastern Rites, too. Mm -hmm. And um, when, if, they, if they have updated and modernized their liturgies, the, the Catholic, traditional Catholics should not be involved in that. They should not go to them because they're imbibing the modernist principles of Vatican II and afterwards. They're imbibing the modernist principles embodied in the Novus Ordo of Paul VI and applying them within the, uh, the Eastern Rite. Um, not only that, um, but, you know, if they're pronouncing the creed and they're, they're um, deliberately omitting the filioque, that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son, again, this is the orthodox error. And they should not, no traditional Catholic should be partaking in that. I mean, John Paul II can celebrated liturgy with Orthodox, with the schismatic Orthodox. He can celebrate this before the, on the, the altar of the world, so to speak, okay? And he <clears throat> joined them in omitting the filioque. <clears throat> he omitted that from the creed, which is a, a very, well, it's a very bad thing. I mean, it's contrary to the Catholic faith to do that. But he did this publicly, flaunting it. And others, I, th I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Benedict XVI did the same thing. Really? If I'm not mistaken, I could be, but I, I, I don't think so. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, this is a, a very telling, I want to use another word, but it's a very telling statement, you know, against the faith. Mm -hmm. That they're compromising the faith. It's the least you can say, right? Mm -hmm. Scandalous, but um, no, a traditional Catholic should not have anything to do with that. Okay, Father, I know we re received another email where a viewer said that uh, he wanted to know if it was correct that the reforms of Vatican II they did not apply to the Eastern Rites. Well, technically speaking, the Eastern Rites have their own uh, canon law. They have their own section of canon law that applies to them. Okay, so the canon law that was revised by John Paul II came out in 1983-84. Um, actually does not um, specifically apply to the, the Eastern rites of the Catholic Church, okay? I'm, I don't really know the ins and outs of that, but they really are treated separately. Okay. So, uh, um, but, but again, I mean, what all this means is that their own clergy can be modernized, their own hierarchy can, can implement the program of modernism mm -hmm. in those rites so what, what much saying, more easily now. What you're saying, Father, is, is that the validity of their sacraments and their holy orders and all that, that that necessarily isn't, that is not necessarily the problem. The real problem is their communion with Rome, modernist Rome, and their acceptance of the post well, II teachings. Uh, and acceptance of the modernist principles insofar as they are in communion with <coughs> But the enemies of the church, basically. Mm -hmm. And they give communion to those who are not of the faith. And um, yeah, they're, they're practicing things that the church has always condemned. Now, Tom, I'm really not familiar with uh, you know, any changes to the rites of ordination of priests or consecration of bishops in the Eastern rites. Okay. I haven't studied that, I don't know. I'd like to, I'd like to be aware of it, but I'm not. Okay. So if they have undergone this, this, this process of, quote-unquote, modernizing all of their sacramental rites. Uh, I know there has been some modernization. I don't know to what extent it's gone. Okay. And I don't know uh, if it's affected all of the sacramental rites they have or not, okay. including ordination and consecration. But I would like to know if there are those who are um, <coughs> Eastern Rite Catholics, they might well be able to tell how far that modernization has gone in the Eastern Rites. Okay. When I was in Rome, I, uh, I would go to a little Ukrainian church, rarely, but I did go, where they still offered the, the traditional Ukrainian Rite. It was very beautiful. Uh, very small, <coughs> somber, respectful, very, very solemn, actually. But an old priest would offer the old Ukrainian rite. But then the Ukrainian um, uh, church um, on the Geniculum was updated. 
And they were following some new way, which was not the, the old way uh, that we found within Rome. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just not sure of what the relationship was between... Uh, even the, the little Ukrainian church I went to, I'm not sure if they were uh, allowed to do that, forbidden to do it, if they were condemned for doing it, I don't know. But they did it, mm -hmm. thank goodness. So uh, I was glad to see someone was still following the, the old traditional Ukrainian right. Father, we received another email with a link to an article here requesting your your comments. They weren't sure if you had seen this. Back in February 23rd, there's an article here from Rad Trad Thomist website. And I'll just read the headline here. It Rad says, Trad. Rad Trad, Rad Trad, Trad Thomist. Thomist. Rad okay. Trad Thomist. Yeah. It's the, uh, the headline is, The Byzantine Catholic Patriarch communica Excommunicates Francis for Heresy and Forbids the Priests and Bishops to Mention Him in the Divine Liturgy. That's the Orthodox. Mm -hmm. Yes, they find him heretical. Yeah. Isn't that isn't that something? You know what? That is actually um, a fulfillment of what Cardinal Ottaviani wrote in 1970, 1969, in his Ottaviani intervention, who predicted that the modernism coming in in the Novus Ordo Mass, and not just the modernism in the Mass, but the modernist principles that were coming in, were going to alienate alienate the Orthodox even more and drive them away. And you don't hear too much about that aspect of Cardinal Ottaviani's intervention, which every traditional Catholic has to read and understand to really be a traditional Catholic. They just have to know what Cardinal Ottaviani wrote in 1969 about the new Mass, because everything he wrote has come true. And that's one of the things that has come true, which is often, I think, left aside, and that is I mean, the only Orthodox who really seem to be willing to deal with Francis are the Russian Orthodox, who, according to reports, are just <clears throat> working, working to use the Vatican now for their own purposes. But the other Orthodox, they, they just they, they find uh, the modernism of Francis to be either a laughingstock or a downright offensive, and they want nothing to do with it. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, unless they're, they're so degraded that, 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 you know, they've taken the name Orthodox for the, some kind of uh, basic uh, circus sideshow. And there are a lot of, lot of schismatic groups that have spun off of the Orthodox who are working with Protestantism, <clears throat> various radical Protestant groups, and they don't even re resemble even, even uh, historical Orthodoxy anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, so they, they've just gone so far off the beam. Okay. Father, another related question. We had someone email and asked, why the, uh, why the Greek Orthodox Church, why when making the sign of the cross they go from right to left versus the traditional left to right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Well, you know, one could say that this is how it was done in the old days, I mean, before, even before they broke away. I don't know the answer to that question. <clears throat> That's why I'm saying. I don't know <clears throat> if the Orthodox traditionally went like this, okay, they, I'm sorry, um, for some reason, uh, traditionally went like this or not, I don't know, <clears throat> maybe they did, maybe it's, <clears throat> if it wasn't that way, if they just, if it came in after the schism, if it's, it's a way of, of distinguishing themselves from Catholics, because as you know, Protestantism itself was something of protest, so whatever they do, they do in protest of what the Catholics do, so they have to find something else like contrary to do just to show that they're Protestants, denying this and denying that, even things that seem ridiculous to deny, you know, they're willing to deny just for the sake of saying, we're Protestants, we don't do what Catholics do. That's the foundation of their religion as a protest of what we believe. But so to find the Orthodox uh, undertaking or uh, initiating things that say, okay, this is going to show we're not Roman Catholics, would not be surprising. I don't know, though. I don't know for a fact the origin of that. So uh, that's a good question, and I would like to know. So I, remind me, and I will get an answer for you, okay? okay. <laughs> cool. 
Uh, okay, fine. Then a question about the Chaldean right? Chaldean right? Uh, a viewer, he wanted to know if you knew for a fact that the ordination of the priests and bishops had been changed. Um, mm, I don't know. Invalidating. Okay, he says, uh, if if it was not changed, if the change was not done, then it seems that that would be a viable option for traditional Catholics because their um, their holy orders would still be valid. And this would still be a valid right. So could that, if the if the right of ordination was not changed in that Chaldean right, if it was still valid, would that be a good option for? If it was still valid, the fact that the right might not have changed, the fact that there are, let's say, traditional Chaldean bishops, either because the right hasn't changed or because within the right, there are those who have not changed, right? Mm -hmm. But if you could trace back their orders and establish the validity going back, without question. Um, then, yeah, one, one could make a very solid and secure argument that um, the ordinations would be valid, consecrations would be valid. But um, again, one, one would have to be sure that it hasn't been corrupted by modernism. And I just don't know enough to say that it hasn't. I do know this, though, that in that part of the world, there are those who are so fiercely attached to their, their, their ancient culture that they have a very powerful incentive to, to sustain the traditional right and refuse to change it because they, they are subject to pressures of all kinds. And um, they fight those pressures um, by, by even stubbornly uh, insisting they will not change. So it is very possible that you might find those who are holding on to their traditional rights. Now, I, I, I qualify this again by saying, of all of <clears throat> the rights that I would have thought would have maintained their integrity through all of this by fighting for their cultural integrity, <clears throat> let alone their religious integrity, would have been the Maronite right. I mean, the right that uses the Aramaic <clears throat> language. And yet I find that the Maronite priests have actually updated and gone in with modern culture. And I, they're the last ones on the face of the earth I thought would have compromised, but they have. Now that doesn't mean they all have. But the fact is, I mean, you can, you can find Maronite uh, priests in this country who come from old country, come from Lebanon. <coughs> but they have enculturated here in America. And they have these hybrids, and, and, not, and, and you might say, well, why would they do this? And the answer might well be what someone, one of them told me. Well, we come to this country and we find that the next generation or the current generation coming up of the descendants of the Maronite, right, like the Lebanese people, have become so <clears throat> corrupted with the, the culture of the society they're living in that they, they are hardly identifiable anymore as Maronites, they can be identifiable as Lebanese <coughs> descendants, but that doesn't include their religious uh, heritage. And so it's necessary for us now to uh, accommodate the, the religious practice to them and their tastes and their American culture. Hmm. So this, this would be fatal to the Maronite right to do that, unfortunately. We see there are those who say, well, I have no choice. Okay. Father, I think we have time for a couple more emails, so I'd like to, uh, to discuss these, these few related ones here. I know we have one from a viewer who asked your opinion on receiving government assistance and participating in government assistance programs, such as we have the WIC program, the, um, the food stamp program, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, things like that. Is there a uh, traditional Catholic stance on participating in these government assistance programs? Well, not really, as long as you really need it and aren't sealing it. <laughs> you know, if you qualify, I mean, that's what the programs are for. Ordinarily, the church would say, well, charity is the business of the church. So, so our Lord said, I may as be about my father's business. In Greek, the word isn't really business, okay? But that's the way it's translated. But the sense of the, the things that concern my father, I must be about those things, right? So, you know, the church always considered that charity is the, 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 the work of the church and justice is the work of the government. The government must not be involved in the work of charity because 
well, that's where you start getting into socialism. The charity, uh, you know, charity, if the government's in the work of charity, the government has to find the resources to indulge in charity, and she does it by taking from people who have, <laughs> meaning by taxing people, getting it, and then the government decides we're going to give this now to those who are not owed this, but those we feel are in need. Well, again, you know, you can, you, that's the dissolution of a, of a society, because people can start voting for people who are going to give the public monies away and give them up to them in the form of welfare. And uh, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote about this, you know, back in the 1800s, when, when it's possible to vote for yourself, you know, to vote for people who will give out of the public largesse, public generosity to you for voting for them, uh, that's the end of society, you know, and that's what welfare is all about. Nonetheless, it is the interest uh, in the interest of any society to take care of people who really need their help, right? But the church would say that's primarily the work of the church to take care of people who need charity. Um, so, um, but if there's a government program um, that actually uh, does help those who qualify legitimately and are in need, it, there's nothing wrong with them taking taking part in that and receiving public assistance, okay? Okay. Um, it's, not, it's not anything that the church has condemned, certainly. Okay. You know? Now, under, under Francis now, we have a perversion of that whole idea because Francis' whole pitch is that governments are there to give, to, 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 to do that, precisely. Whereas the church has said that's not, the, that's not the role of government, primarily. It's the role of the church, primarily. Okay. Um, but, again, as I say, the church has never condemned public assistance, assistance as such, <clears throat> as long as it's on, honest and legitimately serving the public welfare. Welfare not in the liberal sense, but the, the common good of the society. Mm -hmm. really. Father, doesn't it seem a bit uh, contradictory, though, to those who, uh, <clears throat> let's say, a fiscal conservative who will say uh, programs like, like Social Security, this is a huge drain on our budget. It's totally irresponsible. We, we shouldn't be doing this. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, a lousy use of our of our money. Yet they participate in it. They receive <coughs> funds from Social Security. They pay into this. They receive their funds from Social Security. It it's not a bit. contradiction. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> no, I mean, the program is there. The program has taken from them out of their wages. Yeah. And they have a right to the money that's there. And if that's the way they have to get it, they have a right to do so. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is the dilemma that it puts in, in, in people who are actually contributing to it, so they have a right to it when they need it, because they've been paying into it. The question is whether it's right for the government to be taking that money from them in the first place for a program that ultimately is doomed to failure because it can't keep up with the need. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and provokes more and more people to seek that, seek that help, who are not actually contributing to it. Okay. So, you know, one, one can argue the wisdom of the program or even the viability of the program, but if the program is in place and, and uh, the government has, um, for whatever reason, uh, taken from them their earnings and is holding it and using it to uh, supply a need for other people, then those who've earned the money have a right to it. Okay. And that would certainly apply to those in Social Security. Okay. Uh, last question, Father. We received a request for you to briefly define the uh, Catholic doctrine on a just war. In particular, this, this Bureau was a bit concerned about some of the, uh, the recent wars that our country has been entering into, and if these would qualify as a just war, and if we can support the government in these endeavors. Well, without getting into the practicalities of you know, going into Afghanistan or wherever we went in former times and where we're proposing to go now, um, you know, as far as the principles involved, um, I'll try to remember all of them, okay? There are uh, maybe half a dozen, five or, five or six of them anyway. But obviously, war is a horrible evil, okay? And so it can only be indulged in as the lesser of evils. So whatever the evil is that war is supposed to remedy must be so horrible <laughs> that <clears throat> all the destruction which material and spiritual destruction wrought by war must be the lesser of these evils. That it must not be just 
a matter of guessing, well, maybe war wouldn't be so bad as what's happening now, so let's try war and see if it turns out better than what's going. No, 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 no. It has to be very clear, cut choice, that the evil is so great. The, the, the evil is so great, not just uh, what might happen if we don't go to war, but the situation here and now is so clearly evil that it is, it is truly, reasonably, uh, the, le the lesser of two evils to go to war, to protect whatever, you know. Now, <clears throat> war costs lives. Are there, are there values that are greater than, than lives? Actually, yes, there are, right? The church has always understood that, right? Her crusades, lives are risked, right, for some great noble ideal, right? And um, the, um, uh, the same with property, right? Property, massive destruction of property. Are there worse evils than the massive destruction of property? Yes, okay. Um, one of our own uh, great patriots, Pactor Henry, is quoted as saying, give me liberty or give me death. And the church would not object to that statement if by that he meant that my liberty to me is worthy of risking my life. <clears throat> Uh, to secure my liberty, okay? Um, so, just, you know, on that point, there really is no dispute in the church that this war can be the lesser of two evils, but it has to be certain that it has to be that bad. <laughs> There's no question about it. Um, but it has, to be, it has to be just also in the sense that, that you're, you're not attacking innocence, okay? Um, <clears throat> that you don't, uh, you know, uh, uh, go after the problem by inflicting massive injustice on those who themselves are not guilty of anything. So you have to secure their welfare also. And uh, you can't go after, let's say, someone who is threatening you immediately with grave harm <clears throat> uh, at the expense of some innocence, uh, who, you know, collateral damage. You can't do that. Okay. Um, Bishop Sheen spoke out very much against the dropping of the atomic bomb. Uh, as I recall, he said, as soon as that bomb was dropped, I, we knew that the rules of warfare had changed, you know, because of all of the innocents whose lives were destroyed by that bomb, indiscriminate bombing. Now, there are those who are good, decent people who were involved um, in the war who thought that, that was a good and necessary thing. And they have arguments, you know, saying, well, this would have happened or that would have happened or the alternative would have been to evade Japan and to have invaded Japan, landing on mainland Japan and fighting your way through would have been a bloodbath. No doubt that it's true. That in itself would not necessarily justify dropping the atomic bomb on a civilian population, of course, in any case. <clears throat> but, um, so, you see, things get a little complicated. <laughs> a little, uh, um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, one thing that, that is not complicated is what Our Lady said at Fatima, that war is a punishment for sin. And uh, so the solution we see for war is stop sinning. Return to God, be faithful to God, and God will protect you from this great evil. Um, um, as far as, you know, pursuing the question of what constitutes uh, legitimate, I, I guess I've, I've laid down the basic principles for it, okay? Oh, well, war also cannot be just individual. It has to be declared according to law in the sense that uh, the authority in any government that is entrusted with that decision has to be observed. So, you know, in this country, Congress has to approve a declara any declaration of war. We've gotten away from that because presidents have simply usurped that right, I believe, anyway, in a kind of making distinctions between war, police actions. Uh, you know, they, they give a variety of names to what they're doing to get around it, right? To use the United States military <clears throat> around the globe to attack other pe other peoples or other governments or, or, or whatever. Um, but it's a matter of the United States Constitution here that is at issue, okay? And, um, but it is a matter of the public authority, legitimate public authority has to make that declaration of war. Um, and um, 
In doing so, I mean, the, uh, the, the government of a country can actually impose an obligation on segments of the population to actually fight, risk their lives and go and fight. That's a huge responsibility, huge mm -hmm. responsibility there. So one has to be very, very, very careful sure. about using and abusing that power. Uh, a lot of responsibility before Almighty God. But uh, getting back to the diabolical delusion, it is not surprising that the powers of hell want warfare. I mean, they declared warfare against God, and they want warfare not only in hell against God, they want warfare against God here. And so they will use not only spiritual warfare, they will use, they will use a physical warfare to fill the coffers of hell with souls, so to speak. There's a kind of an interesting, maybe I'm changing the subject, okay, but there's an interesting statement here by a professor, Neil Postman, and who wrote, Amusing Ourselves to Death, Discourse in the Age of Show Business. And this is very obliquely connected with this question, question obliquely, but I thought it was interesting because this appears on a site that is very much anti-war, that is totally against the idea of the United States being involved in all these wars. And that's why this came to mind, <clears throat> because this website, lewrockwell.com, <clears throat> anti-state, anti-war, pro-market is how they build themselves. <laughs> <clears throat> carries this, and, and the, the title of the article here by a John Whitehead is, is uh, of the Rutherford Institute is Dial T for Tyranny, While America Feuds, the Police State Shifts into High Gear. So his idea is that all of this is a distraction. All of this drum beating and all of this saber rattling is a distraction to get us more deeper and deeper into tyranny. This is what he says. Big Brother does not watch us by his choice. We watch him by ours. There is no need for wardens or gates or ministries of truth. When a population becomes distracted by trivia, when cultural life is re redefined as a perpetual round of entertainments, when serious public conversation becomes a form of baby talk, when, in short, a people become an audience and their public business a vaudeville act, then a nation finds itself at risk. A cultured death is a clear possibility. This is quoted from Professor Neil Postman as a prologue to the article by John Whitehead. And Whitehead ends... We have moved beyond the era of representative government and entered a new age. You can call it the age of authoritarianism, or fascism, or oligarchy, or the American police state. Whatever label you want to put on it, the end result is the same, tyranny. It's an interesting article, actually. And one of the things that he, uh, that he talks about in here is the, the, all of this, this, this using... Wars, police actions, and so on, uh, to basically move the population toward uh, tyrannical control. So uh, I thought it was kind of curious. So, um, you know, there's a side issue to this whole question of the Catholic teaching on just war that is being brought out here, and that is the question of how war is used by the rhinos have calculated that we have to have wars. We have to have certain wars in order to have the economy of the world grow a certain way. Okay? And how there's a segment of the population of the world <clears throat> that has been financing wars, not only to enrich themselves, but financing both sides of wars to move the nations of the world toward a one-world government including a, a also a one-world form of religion, of worshiping the state, government as God. So I think uh, e even apart from this question of the church's teaching on the justice of wars, we have to, we have to look and see the war as a tactic or as a tool of totalitarianism and tyranny. Okay. Um, so maybe we can talk about that sure. sometime also. <laughs> 
One thing we know, though, when Our Lady says that this diabolical disorientation, um, which is the result of sin, always involves wars. We know where the real war is to be fought. It's to be fought on the battleground of the human soul, whether that soul be faithful to God or not, Tom. And that's what, that's what our faith is all about. That's where the battleground is there. We, as St. Paul says, we're fighting against principalities and powers, the powers of darkness in high places. That's where this war is fought. And how do we know who is alive and who is dead in this war? How do we know who's uh, alive and fighting the battle? How do we know who's missing in action? How do we know who's a prisoner of war? How do we know who's the enemy? It comes down to a matter of being in the state of grace. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. If you're in the state of God's grace, you are alive. If you are not, you have been, you are either dead and, and not uh, fighting the battle or you're fighting it for the enemy. You're giving aid and comfort to the enemy, certainly. You're a prisoner of war, and that's Satan's prisoner, right? Um, missing in action, whatever it is, you know, if you're not in the state of grace, you are not fighting the war that, that must be fought. Right. Well, Father, we've uh, we've covered a lot of ground tonight, so I think we could end there. Although I see that you still have quite the stack of emails or, or different topics in front of you, so I'll leave the decision up to you. <clears throat> well, uh, Tom, I, I do want to respond uh, as far as possible to the points brought up. The thing is, you know, those who even give you just a sentence or two, they they talk about things that involve a lot. Oh yeah. Uh, so we've got some pretty good, good thinkers out there. So I really appreciate the questions, and I apologize if it's taken a while to get to them. But uh, hopefully you'll persevere, and we will persevere and get to them. Sure. Yep, definitely. Well, thanks for being here today. Mm -hmm. I appreciate time. your time. You're very welcome. Yep. Thank you. No problem. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady of Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.